1937, the artist Augusta Savage was commissioned to make a sculpture that was going to go on the grounds of the 1937 World's Fair. As a female, as an African American, it was a big deal. She was commissioned along with iconic artists of her time like William de Kooning and Salvador Dali. She made a piece called The Harp, and if you look at pictures of it, it's monumental, it's gorgeous. And at the end of the fair, she didn't have enough money to cast it in bronze or to even move it to a different location, so they had it destroyed. She spent most of her life in Harlem running her arts and crafts studio, a community center where she trained and mentored and taught. And she had this to say about her life's work. I have created nothing really beautiful, really lasting. But if I can inspire one of those youngsters to develop the talent I know they possess, then my monument will be in their work. And as a teacher, I cling to that every day. It's a solo episode, my friends, so put the phone back in your pocket. Creating Behavior starts now. my fellow daydreamers. You know what's interesting about Augusta Savage? Now, I had no idea who she was, okay? Never heard of her before until I read about her in the New York Times and was fascinated by her life. This is a woman who, you know, we're talking about the 1920s, 1930s. Talk about misogyny. Talk about racism. As an African-American female sculptor and artist to carve out a life for yourself. This woman had a hell of a lot of grit. There's a particular anecdote that uh, I'll share with you. You know, she was accepted. This was like 1923. Okay, she was one of 100 women awarded a scholarship to attend the Fontainebleau School of Fine Arts in Paris. Okay, so that's, that's pretty amazing. But when the admissions committee realized that they had actually selected a black woman, they rescinded her acceptance. And this is what they said in a letter explaining the decision. They expressed concern that disagreeable complications would arise between Savage and the students from the southern states. Undeterred, the woman continues to create. She ends up getting commissioned for work in Paris, and in the late 20s and 30s, she ends up spending many years there, ironically having her work shown in galleries all across the city. And, you know, I read this article and it just inspired me. You know, she comes back to Harlem, she uh, opens up her, her own studio where she trains and teaches, mentors, and it was an exceptional life, and a life that, that should be uh, recognized. And there are calls, actually, for the harp to be recreated and placed out front of the Museum of African American History in Washington, D.C., which I think would be a fantastic idea. Just a a quick update on the home front, personally. Got the J&J one-and-done vaccine last week. Trish got the first shot of the Pfizer, so, you know... We've taken our a first step to kind of reclaiming our life. Hopefully maybe be able to re-engage a little bit more consistently with the world, especially as we get into the summer here. And you want to be outside and socializing with your friends and your family. I had about 24 hours where I felt like shit. You know, I got the chills and I was fatigued, felt like I was hit by a Mack truck. But other than that, no problem. So, all of you out there, I hope you are, despite whatever anxieties or reluctance you have, getting the shot. I think it's the right thing to do. Now, I got a lot of stuff on my desk, some things that have piled up, some things I'd like to share with you, so let's go through these and then we'll get out of here, okay? I know that 
<clears throat> you know, there are many of you out there, you're probably in your 20s, maybe your early 30s. Just got out of school, you've trained, and you're thrust out into the business. Some of you might have come to acting later in life, you know, maybe gave up a career to pursue what you really wanted to do. Or maybe you've just been at it for 15, 20 years, still grinding it out, you know, doing your survival jobs, taking your day players, your under fives, the occasional guest spot perhaps, and thinking to yourself, God, what's, what's this going to lead to? Do you know? Most actors, they're going to quit after maybe three or five years. You know, if I have a class of 20 students that I send out into the world, <clears throat> I don't know, maybe four or five of them are still going to be pursuing a professional acting career in five years. And for a number of reasons, right? It's a very difficult business. It's hard. There's a lot of rejection. There's a lot of uncertainty. You know, you got to deal with money and finances and paying your bills. And, and at the end of the day, you just want to be happy. But you know what can happen when you get out and start pursuing your career is that there's this sense that it's got to happen now. That my career, my life is a sprint. And if I'm not booking major work and seeing some big strides in the next few years, then that must mean A, I'm not talented, or B, uh, it's just not going to work out for me. I'm going to be stuck waiting tables until I'm 50. And it can be very discouraging. That's why actors, you know, like dealing with depression and anxiety. and Because it is. It's a lot of rejection. It's hard to, to keep, you know, your heart and your soul um, in a good place so that you can, can do your work. And this is why I am thrilled by the story of Paul Racy, nominated this year for an Oscar for his performance in Darius Martyr's film, Sound of Metal. Now, Paul Racy, he's 72 years old. He has been grinding out a career for well over 40 years out in Los Angeles. Day players, under fives, working in black box theater, never without a survival job. He was working as a sign interpreter for the L.A. County Superior Court System. That was his day job. He grew up as a child of deaf adults and so knew sign language very well, understood the deaf community. So that's what he was doing by day. And then at night, he would be going to the black box. He would be working with the Deaf West Theater out in L.A. where he was able to continue to hone his craft and continue to work as an actor and then all of a sudden he's plucked out of obscurity he puts himself on tape and Darius Martyr sees it and says this is the guy this is the guy now you want to talk about perseverance talk about you know believing in yourself and just enjoying the journey I mean look to Paul Racy and there's a particular scene in the film. I mean, it's the reason he got nominated. The kitchen table, he's sitting there with Riz Ahmed and he has to kick Riz out of the, of the house. He violated some rules and he's gotta go. And what made it so painful for Paul's character is that he really grew to like Riz Ahmed. He became such a part of the community, was doing all the right things, had grown so much, was really looking to him to help take more of a leadership role and now he's got to kick him out and you could see the heartbreak the pain the disappointment in his face exceptional piece of acting so you know when you guys get caught up in thinking to yourself it's got to happen right now I need something to happen today this week next month look to him look to what his life is now and uh, find some inspiration in enjoying the journey. I think that's really important. 
Now, I was also unbelievably moved by an op-ed that I read in the New York Times by a man named Ian Manuel. Now, Ian Manuel, at 15, was arrested for armed robbery, attempted murder. The were crimes that he absolutely committed. He shot a, a woman in the robbery. She survived, but, you know, he was facing serious charges. And his court-appointed attorney said, listen, plead guilty, and I can get you probably 15 years tops and get out on parole and have your life. So he pleads guilty. This is a 15-year-old kid taking the advice of his lawyer. The judge sentences him to life in prison without parole. And this is at 15. And through some, I don't know, in prison violations or whatever was going on in the prison, he was condemned, basically, to long-term solitary confinement. That lasted for 18 years, from 1992 to 2010, from the ages of 15 to 33. He didn't have a window in his room. He wasn't permitted to talk to fellow prisoners, or even to himself. It was silence. Didn't have healthy, nutritious food. He was really just basically given enough not to die. He writes very graphically about what solitary confinement does to someone and what men and women in those situations are willing to do for themselves just to get some human contact. And I'll just read you a little bit from the op-ed. He said, I also witnessed the human consequences of the harshness of solitary firsthand. Some people would resort to cutting their stomachs open with a razor and sticking a plastic spork inside their intestines just so they could spend a week in the comfort of a hospital room with a television, just so they could have a semblance of freedom, just so they could feel human again. He also writes really eloquently about how he survived using his mind and his imagination. It was the only way that he could escape his reality. It's the only place where he could play basketball with his brother or video games with his friends, where he could eat his mother's cherry pie on the porch. It was the only place that he could remember what it was like to be a kid. And, you know, we as actors talk about using our imagination, right, to create behavior, to craft, to envision what's possible in a script. But here's somebody that was using his imagination to just stay alive. And I bring his story to your attention because of the man and the human being that has emerged from this nightmare. He was released recently. He had lawyers and some justice reform groups that found his case, fought for him, and got him released. So now this guy's in his mid-40s, and he is reintroducing himself into a world that he hasn't seen since he was 14 years old. You know, just grappling with PTSD, with the terror of crossing a street and seeing bikes come at you and cars coming at you, learning how to use a cell phone. And what is really special about this and why I I haven't been able to stop thinking about him is he's an artist. That experience did not crush the artist in him. He's a poet. He's a writer. He's got a memoir. He's poured his whole whole story into a memoir. Comes out in May. Um, And he is an advocate and a champion for prison reform, for ending solitary confinement. And... You should follow his Instagram account, at Ian Manuel Official. I'll put it on the links on my website. You'll look at his smile, the gleam in his eye, and you think to yourself, Jesus, man. I I have to put my own shit in perspective. And that's why I, uh, I, I really love his story because, and I think you guys can relate to this, you know, you can become so self absorbed with your own shit. You can also get caught up in in stretches of of victimization. Where like, why is this happening to me? This isn't fair. Nothing's going right. And you can you can feel you know like, boy, everything's just conspiring against me. Read his story. Look at his life, and look what he's overcome. It will help put your life in just a little bit better perspective. 
And when you can be reoriented just a little bit and say to yourself, wow, <laughs> he went through all of that and still came out um, a productive and open and creative human being, man, we need stories like this. Stories that illuminate for us the indomitable spirit of the human condition. One of my favorite musicians, the vocalist and jazz artist Esperanza Spalding, has some new music that just dropped that I would like to put on your radar. Um, you know, her album, 12 Little Spells, if you've never listened to it, I'll tell you, it, it gives you an idea of the healing power of music and what it can do for you. I, I wanted to bring her up because she has uh, responded to the pandemic in a way that I think uh, any, any artist should attempt. And I'll just give you a quote. This is from an article, again, in the New York Times. You think to yourself, God, is that the only thing he ever fucking reads is the New York Times? No, but there's a lot to be gotten from, from the Times. Uh, this is what she said about the pandemic, and I thought she phrased it really well. She said, people use this weird, uninvited breath of the pandemic to start the things that they've been putting off. That definitely happened for me. I think that's just a great quote, and I love these three words strung together. Weird, uninvited breath. I mean, isn't that just a great way to look at the last year, to look at the pandemic? Certainly uninvited. And as actors, if you think about how important it is to take in, to take in the world, to take that breath, that spontaneous breath, and put something back out into the world that maybe you didn't think existed inside of you, it's fantastic. It's so healthy, I think. About a month into the pandemic, Esperanza and, I don't know, I think it was about maybe eight to ten uh, of her friends and artists, they went back to Portland because that's where she's from and she took 5,000 acres of land and she created a retreat for artists of color to be able to go out and work and enjoy the land and uh, have space to be able to produce art. I just think it's just a fantastic way to pay, to pay your life forward. So I would recommend going to her website, Songwrites Apothecary Lab. Dot com. Listen to her latest drop. It's called Triangle. It's in three segments. She also shot some really artistic video to go with the music. So when you find yourself late at night, you got some candles lit, maybe you burn a little incense, maybe you lit up smoking a joint. I don't know, maybe not. But if you are, pop on Triangle and listen to it. I think it will be a transformative experience for you. We've had some, some death in the last couple of weeks, uh, some artists who have left us, and uh, there are three in particular that I just want to mention because they left an impact on me. Uh, the first is Craig Mums Grant. I'll tell you, I remember being in my 20s, and going to the New Yorkian Poets Cafe down the Third Street, down in the uh, East Village, and listening to Mums the Schemer, this poet that would just drop some truth bombs on those of us that were listening to him, blew me away. If you ever watched Oz, his portrayal as Arnold the poet, he was kind of the soulful center of that great HBO show. He was a man of the theater. He was a hip-hop artist. He worked in film, television. He was a mentor to so many people. I can't tell you how many students, friends, collaborators have had the opportunity to work with him. You know, he dropped dead while he was down in Atlanta working on a show. Uh, if you want to listen to a really good poem of his, because he did a lot of deaf poetry jams, back in the 2000s, his poem, The Truth, part one and two. I'm telling you, it is straight up revelation. Jessica Walter passed away a few weeks ago at the age of 80. 
a full life, a long career. I'm sure you know her best as Lucille Bluth in Arrested Development, which was a masterclass in comedy. If you want to see one of her early films where she really gets to, to show her range, it's a Clint Eastwood film called Play Misty for Me back from 1971. She plays a, a stalker, basically, who uh, loses her shit over the course of the film, and it's, a, it's, it's an excellent piece of acting. But Lucille Bluth, I'd like to talk about that for a second. What she could do with a tilt of her head, with a lilt in a voice, with a raised eyebrow, with a smirk, made her one of the most meme-worthy actresses in social media. I don't know how many of you have posted a Lucille Bluth meme, but I tell you, they're great. And what I loved about her character is she was able to combine kind of two ideas for the part. One, she always seemed to be and responded to everyone in her life, including her children, who she would eviscerate <laughs> uh, every chance she got. But she would work as if she was the only reasonable human being on the planet. And she was able to combine that choice with this sense of complete obliviousness, cluelessness. It was a great combination for a character. And I think she was, you know, arguably the best thing on that show. And Larry McMurtry passed away last week at the age of 84. He was one of my favorite writers. He had an unbelievable career, left a, an amazing body of work. He wrote The Last Picture Show, which Peter Bogdanovich made in a film in 1971, which I talked about actually a couple of weeks ago. Cloris Leachman gave a, a great performance in that film. He won an Oscar for his screenplay of Brokeback Mountain. Talk about a film. He adapted that from a short Annie Proulx story. But the book that left its mark on me, not just as a as a artist, but as an aspiring actor, was Lonesome Dove. Now, Lonesome Dove is an 800-page epic. It is a Western epic, and it revolves around the story of two retired Texas Rangers, and they make this decision to drive cattle all the way up from Texas to Montana. And this was, you know, in the waning uh, years of the Wild West, right? Post-Civil War, 1870s, 1880s. And it was made into a television miniseries in 1989. The cast is second to none. We're talking Robert Duvall, Tommy Lee Jones, Angelica Houston, a young Ricky Schroeder, Robert Yorick, Diane Lane... My homework assignment for you guys, if you've never watched it, is to watch Lonesome Dove. It is excellent acting across the board. It is a great story, and it is really well told. And if you ever listen to Robert Duvall talk about his work, about his career, he always cites Lonesome Dove as not only his favorite character, but what he thinks is the best work he's ever done. So check out Lonesome Dove. I just remember as a 19-year-old kid watching this just not just transported you know into that time period it was it was such an adventure but the acting was so good and the friendship between Gus and Captain Call who was played by Tommy Lee Jones is is really special so watch it okay rest in peace Jessica Walter Craig Moms Grant and Larry McMurtry now, I have some books here that I'm piling up on my desk that I'm currently reading. You know, I can't read one book at a time. I've got to have like four or five going. I'll pick it up, 10 pages here, 10 pages there. Uh, one, of course, is Cicely Tyson's autobiography, Just As I Am. What an incredible storyteller. Love reading that book. Uh, there's a, a biography of the painter, Francis Bacon, that just came out written by the Pulitzer Prize-winning authors of De Kooning, Mark Stevens, and Annalene Swan. But this looks at the life of Francis Bacon and his art. And if you don't know anything about his art, it's, I'll tell you, talk about working from your id, painting from your id. A lot of his paintings, you know, they look like corpses hanging on, you know, meat hooks, kind of sliced open. It's it's disturbing. It's It's vivid. 
and it certainly uh, kind of reflects kind of some of the darker impulses um, of, of the human psyche. Anyway, it's a fascinating read. I'm also reading uh, the latest memoir and collection of essays by the writer Melissa Phoebos. Now, if you don't know Melissa Phoebos, she's had a, a just a <laughs> an eclectic career. She grew up in New England. She was sexualized, you know, at a young age, and um, her relationship to her body and to her sex, which she talks about in pretty much all of her books, really led her into a life um, that took her a long time to get out of. She was a dominatrix, a professional dominatrix for many years. And now she's a, a teacher, a writer. She's written a, a book called Whip Smart, which talks about her time as a dominatrix, uh, a memoir called Abandon Me, which is about her childhood, and this latest book, Girlhood, which really goes into detail about what it was like as a 12, 13, 14, 15-year-old girl growing far faster than her classmates, being sexualized at an early age, not just by boys her age, but by men as well. It's, um, I think it's, it's an important book. And I just thought I would read to you a little passage to give you a sense of her writing. It's very vulnerable and it's very um, open, which I think is what any really good artist should strive to be. She said, it was hard to know which half of myself to destroy. The versions of me that other people saw and created. The slut, the sullen daughter, the outsider, or the other one who read until her eyes crossed and mine burned with ideas, who loved the power and possibility of her own young body, who glimpsed the cage of society and its open door. To have faith in the latter was tempting, but a risk. She was so capable of being hurt. I tried to hide, to starve, to gorge, to detach, to escape, to deny, but nothing worked for any length of time. Some days, I knew that the only way to find relief would be to destroy them both, and that I already knew how to do. So you can tell she's got a, a, a voice and a style. Um, so I, I highly recommend Girlhood by Melissa Phoebos. There's also an important exhibition now at the Metropolitan Museum of Art here in New York City. It is a retrospective of the artist Alice Neal, an exceptional career. She painted people, really, primarily. Most of her work is uh, her friends, relatives, strangers, people that she would find interesting on the street. She would ask if she could paint them. And it's a body of work that really does um, say something about the human condition. She called herself a collector of souls. Which I think is such a great way to not just describe herself as a painter, but when I think of actors and, you know, being challenged with figuring out how many shoes you can step into, how many parts of the human experience can you illuminate, I think that actors too are collectors of souls. And she said this about her work, which resonated with me. She said, I have tried to assert the dignity and eternal importance of the human being. What a line, right? The dignity and eternal importance. And then she said this about her 60-year career. She said, I like to paint people who have been ruined by the rat race in New York City. They're damaged and they're mutilated, but they're still kicking. And I'd like to think that that relates to all of us who have been uh, gnawed at and chewed at by life, but we get the fuck back up and we still kick. So if you get a chance, check out Alice Neal's work at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Now, a few weeks ago over in France, there was a wave of protests throughout the country. We're talking about thousands of protesters were marching in the streets demanding the reopening of theater. They marched by the thousands. They forced their way into locked theaters. 
They stormed the stages demanding that arts workers and that the national theaters of France open up. You see, in France, they do not look at theater and the arts as inconsequential entertainment. You see, we don't have that tradition here. We don't, uh, you know, we've always viewed, I think collectively, right, actors, that, that kind of cultural work, stage acting as child's play. And, you know, in terms of this pandemic, the arts, the theater, uh, all of the people, not just actors, but everyone that's involved in, in bringing theater to life have been decimated by this pandemic. Do you know that France has six national theaters? We don't have one. And, you know, it says something when uh, at the César Awards, which I think is the equivalent of their Oscars, this actress, Corinne Massiero, she was asked to um, present one of the awards. So she shows up draped in what looked like a donkey carcass. It was bloody. She was naked underneath. She comes up on stage, drops the uh, donkey carcass on the floor, and across her body is painted the words, no culture, no future. And I just think to myself, where, where are the protests in the street for reopening the theaters? You know, as a society, we flock to it. We flood to the theater. But yet we don't want to support it. We don't want to support the labor that goes into maintaining it. Biden, just in the last uh, recovery bill, gave $470 million to support uh, the arts. $470 million? That's a pittance. When Broadway, Broadway alone, brings in almost $15 billion of revenue to New York City. And I just think that for those of us that have skin in the game, those of us that, you know, toil and sweat to provide this kind of cultural nourishment to our society as a whole, where are we when it comes to standing up and fighting, to getting our theaters open back up, to get people working again? I think it's something that we need to consider. And the SAG Awards came out a couple of weeks ago. I always like looking at those because I don't, I participated in the voting. I think all of you that are union members, uh, hopefully you uh, gave voice to the performances that you, that you liked. Uh, and I, for the most part, I thought they got it right. You know, a couple really stood out to me. You know, the woman who plays the grandma, Yunya Jun in Minari. What an amazing performance. You know, you look at... Uh, she really was the, the heart and soul of that film. The way she relates to her grandson after she finds out that, you know, he pissed in her Mountain Dew. To be angry, but yet also still understand that it's a boy, a child. And how she chose to deal with him after that, to deal with his hostility towards her, was... Was, was really beautiful and I thought she deserved that. I thought Gillian Anderson deserved winning as well. What a uh, transformational performance is Margaret Thatcher in The Crown. Talk about character work. Talk about behavior. My goodness. Amazing. I also thought that Viola Davis certainly deserved to win. She was fantastic. I thought it was her best work in Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. I did not think that Chadwick Boseman deserved to win. I know that his death, it changes a lot of people's opinions, but honestly, how could you not give it to Gary Oldman? Mank was unbelievable. What? His impediment work, the drunk work, the, the, just the, the overall character of catching this you know historical figure, I thought it was worthy of a SAG award. And I also thought the trial of Chicago 7 deserved the ensemble. Some really good performances, in particular, Jeremy Strong. You know, he played Jerry Rubin in the, um, in the film. And when you put that up against what he does as Kendall Roy in Succession, and you can see his range. I mean, this is a theater actor. This is a guy who's trained. 
Uh, he graduated from Yale with an English degree. He goes to the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts. He studies. He hones his skills in the theater, off Broadway, Broadway, and now you know you're able to see the kind of range he has. Two distinctive performances. He is an actor to follow for sure. And I just wanted to finish this out today with just a, a little advice. <clears throat> you know, my students have said this to me. I know it occurs to me in my own creative work. It's this fear that I am out of ideas, that I'm kind of tapped out. I don't know where the next burst of creativity is going to come from. You're working on a part. Maybe you've got four or five pages of sides. You've got to put yourself on tape. It's due tomorrow morning and you're reading it and you just don't know what to do with it. it they just look like dead words on a page or you're in rehearsal and you, you're you struggling with a particular beat or a moment and you just you feel dead inside. Don't allow yourself to succumb to the insecurities that that fear produces. You have to take in. You have to allow yourself to open to the world. And certainly what I've been sharing with you today and what I try to share with you every week is what I've been taking in. The things that have caused me to think more deeply, to understand something more profoundly about what it means to be human. And it gets added to this internal library that I keep building for myself. And you just never know when something that you've stored away inside of you is going to push its way to the surface and spark an idea for you. Answer a question. Solve a problem. And, you know, Jessica Blank talked about this in our talk back in season one. You know, she does not believe in the word inspiration. She thinks it's horseshit. You got to do the work. And I think if you can take in, continue to feed yourself and do the work, something will come to the surface. Something will surprise you and you'll solve something. You have to have an appetite for the creative struggle. There has to be a part of you that enjoys that because that's what it means to be creative. It means to struggle with something, to solve a problem. And the moment you start to go down the road of feeling um, like a victim, feeling um, despondent, allowing yourself to give over to this idea that maybe I'm just not talented, this inner voice, this inner critic, right? that just wants to eviscerate your self-esteem. You have to intervene with that. And as the great Martha Graham said, you must keep the channel open. And if you can do that and hold on to why you're doing this with your life, hold on to that love of acting, hold on to the fact that you believe deep inside of you that you have something to say, that you have something to contribute. If you can hang on to that for dear life, then you got a shot. And that's all you can ask for. Well, my fellow daydreamers, thank you for sticking around and keeping that phone in your pocket. You can subscribe and follow this show wherever you get your podcasts. And if you got a few seconds and you can jump onto iTunes and give it a review, that would mean a hell of a lot to me personally. You can also go to my website, creatingbehaviorpodcast.com, for the transcripts and links to every single one of these episodes. You can leave me a voice message, subscribe to the newsletter. You can also book me for private coaching. You can follow me on Instagram, at creatingbehavior. My New York City Conservatory at Maggie Flanagan Studio. Lawrence Trailer. Thank you for the music, my friend. I really appreciate it. My friends, stay resilient. Play full up with yourself. And don't ever settle for your second best. My name is Charlie Sandlin. Peace.